Hello again. I hope you liked the first video. Um, well, we are here just to keep talking about malware. So basically in the previous video, we were discussing a little bit more about the malware ecosystem, the history, etc, etc, how the malware is trying to steal our identities, how the malware is used in general by criminal organizations to make benefits, profits, etc. But today, what we are going to do is to see how we defend from malware, okay? So we are going to start first see, looking at how the malware defends from us and then how we defend from malware. So we are going to create this scenario or what we call the ANS race. So if you remember properly in the last day, we just stopped uh, when we were talking about the criminal interest. And the first thing that we are going to ask today is how the malware evolved in the last years. Okay. So there are different concealment strategies that the malware is using to avoid detection. If you remember properly, basically we have the antiviruses and the antiviruses were used to detect malware. How the antiviruses detect malware? They try to identify signatures, basically a combination of bytes all together. And they try to use these signatures to detect whether a binary file is malware or not. This is actually quite good if you have information about every single file in the world. This is something that it will not happen. But when the, mal when the malware creators figured it out, basically what they start to create were protections. And these protections were polymorphism, metamorphism, packing, and also because there are other people that are trying to run the malware and check whether the malware is malicious or is performing malicious activities or not inside of sandboxings they also create systems for anti-sandboxing. Let's watch each of them one by one. Polymorphism. So basically in polymorphism, you have your software, okay? And what you're gonna try to do is to check, okay, well, they are using maybe this section as a signature. So what I'm going to do is just to take everything, encrypt it. I will just leave a decryption key that will be used in runtime. And that's gonna be my variant of malware you can have as much malware as for as many malware as the script uh, as encryption keys you want okay because every time that you encrypt it you are just changing all of the signatures of the malware and also because you have this section of the code that is used to decrypt the malware in runtime you can also create several different versions of that section so it won't be easy to detect it either and with this you can create trillions of different malware by piece of software so basically if you want your antivirus to be able to detect all of them you need to create a signature per piece of malware per variant so imagine that for one single malware you have to create trillions of signatures that doesn't scale okay following the same idea and the same motivation you have metamorphic malware so metamorphic malware is quite similar to polymorphic malware but instead of encrypting the software what you are doing is changing the software code and you are reshaping the code in a way that is exactly the same code but in a different order so the signatures are also broken and you can also do that trillions of times actually you can use something called obfuscation that allows you to do that very very easily okay we have this piece of malware that was able to disassemble itself in runtime create a variant assemble the variant and then infect more computers. And all of this was just run in runtime. There was no need to run anything independently. So it was very, very sophisticated. Okay, you also have packing. Packing is one of my favorite systems uh, in terms of not only for malware, but also for working with uh, software in general. Actually, in the next video, I will tell you about a packing system that I created to evaluate the security of antiviruses. So basically in packing, what you do is that you have your, your system, you compressed it, you can also encrypt it, okay? And you also put all of the library calls in a, in a summary of library calls. Like every link in library is going to be a summary and it's also going to be protected. So it's not really part of the, mal of the memory of the file. So because of that, what you can do is just to have all of this as a compressed pack, that won't be detected because you can also encrypt it, as I mentioned before. So you have break the signatures and you have a section of the code that will unpack it. We put it in a section of memory and it will be recovering the whole system. 
Something very interesting is that there are some packers, so the most popular one is UPX, but there are some packers like Themida that can do that by specific sections of the software. So you don't need to do it all at the same time, so you expose again the software, but you can do it by section and the software is never completely exposed in memory. So you are still protecting this, your software, for system that just try to check the malware in RAM memory. Okay, we will talk about this in a few minutes, that is called dynamic analysis. Talking about dynamic analysis and talking about running the malware, you can also try to run the malware in a sandbox, and your expectations is that the malware will never escape the sandbox. That's not correct. There are some malware that are able to identify the sandboxing system and are able to use vulnerabilities on the sandboxing system to escape the sandboxing and infect the whole system. They can first infect a user level and they infect a root level and with a rootkit they can infect the whole operating system and the whole machine. So you have to be very careful uh, with which kind of malware you're dealing with. Okay? Very important. So how do we fight back? How do we fight against these concealment strategies that just broke antiviruses and make Ryan Dice say antivirus is dead? So we are not going to care only about the signatures, we are going to care also about flows inside of the program, static flows. So we are not going to run the program in theory, but we are going to perform an analysis of every single thing that we can get from the program without running it. We are going to care about flows, we are going to care about API calls, we are going to try to get the disassemble code and we are going to try to find different operations inside of that. Be careful because if the malware is encrypted, this is going to be more challenging. But there are also ways using reverse engineering with tools like Radare or Jitra that you will be able to obtain, that will allow you to obtain this information. However, again, the concealment strategies are your main enemy here. So you will need to dedicate more time depending on how good the concealment is. Obviously, we have dynamic analysis, so we just take the malware, we are going to run the malware, and we are going to try to find indicators of compromise. So these indicators of compromise are going to be, uh, for example, URLs that the malware is using to access, or files that the malware is creating, or registers in my operating system that the malware is manipulating. So basically, the idea is that I'm going to use all of this information to create a profile of the malware, and with this profile, I will be able to identify whether that software is doing something malicious or not. However, as I mentioned, you have also protection for dynamic analysis, so it can use um, your analysis to attack your system. And at the same time, if it detects that you are attacking it, or you are trying to get information from it, it will try to stop its malicious behavior. So you will need to activate triggers in the malware, and that's another area that is very interesting. Actually, I think I can do a video about this. You can also be a bit more lazy, let's say, and try to check all the things in the binary file instead of running it or doing any kind of analysis. So basically you have binary analysis that tries to get some statistics about the malware. You can use engram models, quite popular now because of the LLMs. You can use uh, entropy-based models, and you can try to get information from the malware just by analyzing its guts, okay? It's binary itself. So, uh, after this, one of the things that became very, very popular in the last few years was to use artificial intelligence. And actually, this is the main point of the Android. So at the moment, the Android became like more prominent because the artificial intelligence system were a breakthrough when we were trying to analyze malware. So how the artificial intelligence systems work? So basically, they use all of the previous techniques, data from static analysis, dynamic analysis and binary analysis, they train these machine learning algorithms and with the algorithms they try to predict whether a piece of software is malware or not. For that, just to explain you a little bit more about how these systems can detect malware, what they do is that they use different kinds of algorithms. So for example, if I already know whether my corpus, I mean, if I already know that uh, these pieces of software are malware, and these pieces of software are benignware, what I'm going to try to do is to apply static, dynamic, binary analysis to these pieces, get some data, and because I already have their classification, I'm going to try to teach a machine learning algorithm to find patterns inside those data, okay? And that will be called classification algorithm. 
If you don't know exactly which piece of software is which, and you don't know exactly which one is malware, which one is malware, etc., you can use clustering that is going to try to find the patterns blindly and is going to try to group malware or benignware by similarity. So basically, it groups software by similarity, and then it's when you go to each group, try to analyze some relevant pieces and try to say, okay, it looks like all of these pieces are malware, it looks like all of these pieces are benignware. You can also use like smarter attacks. So for example, if you can use dynamic analysis and you want to attribute the malicious behavior, you can use reinforcement learning. You can try to find paths in the program until you trigger the malicious behavior. And you can have a system that is giving you feedback about how good you are doing that. Okay, that will be the reinforcement. And also you can use huge algorithms, very sophisticated, that the deep learning algorithms that will try to learn from massive quantities of data. And that will give you, in theory, a better perspective of what's malware, what's benignware. Okay? How these algorithms work, how these algorithms are trained, basically you take your corpus, again, you extract some features, as I mentioned, static or dynamic analysis. You can create like a matrix with these features per piece of software. Okay? You sometimes do some feature selection just to reduce the size because sometimes there are more features, a lot of features that are just redundant or not relevant or spare. Then you train a machine learning algorithm. Okay, this is the process that is more relevant and depending on how big the algorithm or the system is, you might need a lot of computational power, especially these days with deep learning. And once you have that trained algorithm or model, you use the model to detect new pieces of software and discriminate between malware and malware. So basically, that's the do-re-mi of machine learning. And just to give you a little bit about what I've been doing in this area, so I was focused on binary analysis when I was working at UCL years ago, and what we did, what we did is to create entropy profiles for specific binaries. So basically, we took the binary, we were dividing the binary into sections, and in each section, we calculated the entropy, creating like a time series. And with this, if I remember properly, we have 97% accuracy detecting malware. And it was so much fast that the state of the art, like, I think in the best case scenario, it was 3,000 times faster than the other techniques. So we were very, very satisfied on that. Just keep that in mind because we will have the other side of the story after in the next video. Also, there's a very popular tool. You know, our tool was for Windows malware. There's some another popular tool called RebelDroid that was for Android malware. And RebelDroid was using permissions, API calls, and different static analysis features, and it was able to detect malware with 98% of accuracy, which is unbelievably good. So basically, this was telling us, oh look, machine learning might be the solution for detecting malware. Even more, if we want to PDF malware, we found two very popular tools, one is called PDF Rate and the other one is called HITOS, and both of them have an accuracy of 99% detecting malware. So imagine that 99%, so it's even better than any kind of antivirus. And in terms of the trade off, the trade off is very cheap to train these algorithms. So people were quite satisfied. So the question that people were doing that day is okay, so. Machine learning looks pretty good. Does it solve the problem? And the answer, as you can imagine, is no. Because if the answer would be yes, I wouldn't have a job now. So basically, they are different systems that we will talk about in the next video that are called adversarial machine learning system that proves that the moment that you put a machine learning system in front of an adversary, the system fails very, very bad. But this is something that we are going to discuss in the next video. We are going to see the countermeasure against our AI systems. Okay, so I hope you liked the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.